Convos with Creative People is a podcast about creative paths and processes. Each episode features interviews with creators of all genres and mediums and discussions on writing, art, design, marketing, music, podcasting, and more. On the show, I talk with people not just about the things they create, but also how they do what they do and the journey that led them to where they are. Hey everyone, this is Brian here, and welcome to the second episode of the newly revamped Convos with Creative People. As I mentioned in the first episode with Travis Legg, every month I'm going to have a new episode of the show uh, speaking with a new creator from all different mediums and genres. However, in between those episodes, I'm going to reach back into the archives, mostly of the Secret Identity podcast, for interviews that I've done over the years and kind of using these sort of middle episodes as an opportunity to do kind of an archive of them and, and bring them back out for people that may have never heard them before. And so since the first episode of Convos with Creative People was about role-playing games, I thought it would be good to have this sort of archive episode also tie into that as well. Well, back in 2008, which is now more than 12 years ago when, when this was initially recorded, my friends Alana Abbott and Max Saltonstall went with me to DDXP 2008, which was a, uh, it used to be called Winter Fantasy, but it was Wizards of the Coast's uh, D&D sort of mid-year convention. But this year that we went was a very special one, and we were sort of there to cover the impending launch of the fourth edition of Dungeons and Dragons. And so when we went there, this was a time, if if you remember, if you kind of followed that stuff at all, where D&D was trying to really go into the digital realm. They had their own social site called Gleemax. They were going to do a, a lot of sort of virtual game table stuff with the fourth edition of D&D. And a lot of that stuff didn't come to fruition in the way that they had initially envisioned it. But what we see now with D&D Beyond is a lot closer to kind of what they were trying to do back then. But it was it was a time of great excitement for D&D back at that point in time. There was a new edition of the game coming out, which is always a hugely exciting time. And in going down to DDXP, we got to play adventures in the new D&D rule set with creators of the fourth edition. And we also went down there to cover the, you know, the... Um, the show and also to talk to a lot of the creators there. And so I have a handful of interviews that we did back then with creators of the fourth edition, but the one that I'm going to roll out today is actually with the creator of the Forgotten Realms, Mr. Ed Greenwood, who is a legend in the industry. Um, I've talked before in a variety of shows about how Dragonlance was my favorite setting for D&D, but Forgotten Realms is arguably the best known setting, and it was the base sort of setting for the fourth edition of D&D. And so there was a, a RPGA a living campaign where, where people were running adventures in the Forgotten Realms. And so getting down, getting to sit down with Ed Greenwood and talk about not only the realms themselves, but how they were changing for the fourth edition and sort of what people could expect was amazing. He is a super nice guy. And it was a little bit intimidating to sit down with such a legend at the time, but he's just put you at ease immediately. And we had a great conversation about sort of what was happening with the realms at the time, what was happening with D&D at the time, what was exciting to him about that whole process. And he also kind of teased some of the stuff that he was working on, one of which was a, a series called Waterdeep, which is a series of novels that are all out now. And I'll put a link to them in the show notes. So you can go check those out if you want. But we talked about sort of what supplements were coming out for the Forgotten Realms at the time. And it was just, it's a perfect example of what I want these archive interviews to be, which is kind of a time capsule. And at this point in time, and I think it was in April of 2008 when we went out and, and went to the show, and this interview initially posted like over that summer, right before everything was coming out. And so it's just a time capsule to go back and hear these interviews. Um, one thing I will say just in terms of quality is that a lot of the interviews that were done in the past, like for Secret Identity or, or these ones as well, we were doing them at conventions. And so a lot of times you're doing them with other people around. And so you'll hear background noise in this. The audio quality may not be the best, but 
I feel like the content and the conversation is really something that people will appreciate. And so even if the audio quality is not great in some of these archive interviews, I'm still going to post them um, and people can take them or leave them. But if you're a fan of D&D, if you're a fan of the Forgotten Realms, if you've ever read any of the novels that tie into the realms, uh, if you've played D&D in the past, uh, I think you'll appreciate this interview with Ed Greenwood from 12 years ago now. So uh, again, you can check the show notes, which I'll put up on cbrianwright.com for links to some of the stuff that Ed talks about in here, including an archive of the Living Forgotten Realms RPGA uh, sort of campaign as well, just so you can go back and, and dig into some of that stuff if you're if you're a fan of, uh, of D&D. And of course, I will be back next month with a new episode featuring a new interview. As I said, these are going to alternate. So new interview, archive interview sort of thing. But let me know what you think of this one. Obviously, you can hit me up on Twitter at Wright. You can comment on the blog. I appreciate you listening and uh, enjoy this conversation with Ed Greenwood. And this is Brian here, and I am joined by a legend in the gaming industry, Mr. Ed Greenwood. Thank you for taking time out to meet with us today, sir. A pleasure. What can I help you with? Well, we're here at DDXP 2008, and as you know, because you were there at the launch meeting this morning, it is a very exciting weekend because we're seeing our first glimpse at the fourth edition of Dungeons and & Dragons, and it's even more special in terms of the Forgotten Realms, because Forgotten Realms is going to be the major campaign setting that launches with this new fourth edition. So I wanted to start off first by just asking you, how was that morning meeting for you to see all the fans in there and sort of see the unveiling? What did you think of this morning's presentation? I thought it was great. It was exciting to see all the people, and I was sitting there going, oh, we've got so much work to do. And, and that that's what I was taking from it, because at first, people are quiet, they're listening, they're taking it all in, and the questions come, and the questions keep coming, and they're, okay, people are interested, because if they didn't care, they wouldn't be asking all these questions. Okay, and the questions are getting more and more specific. Okay, they're, they're, they're into this. Okay, now, we have to be ready. Now, when I say we, I mean everybody working on the Forgotten Realms, and there's people inside the company, and there are people outside the company, and I'm outside the company. So I, I don't know some of the details, the stuff they're preparing. I don't know their timetables. I don't know when. But I have to remember the key things that were asked for that might be in a product that I don't know about or might not be. So I, have, I remember them so I can say, oh, somebody asked about this. we got to make sure that's covered. And so I'm at that exciting point where, oh, do we have a lot of work to do? Oh, is this going to be fun? Or on a, it's sort of like somebody introduces you to a new railway. And you're standing there on the platform looking at this new train pulling in. They say, come on, get aboard. You go, where's it going? We don't know. It's going to be great. So that's where I am right now. It's like, cool. You know, and, and I, I realize that's a horribly overused word. But I, it's, I'm at that excited point where I just, you're using the word to signify, I am excited. This looks really cool. This looks really interesting. Let's do it. Well, and also, I mean, you have... There's so many great worlds that have been created in sort of the D&D universe. You've got the realms, you've got Dragonlance, you've got Ravenloft, you've got Greyhawk. To have a, a beloved setting like Forgotten Realms become sort of the face of the fourth edition of D&D, how, how is that for you? Because it's always been an extremely popular setting. It's not certainly not by any means unknown. It's a beloved setting, but now it's kind of stepping up and being the face of 4E. So what do you think about that? Well, it, it was the face of 2E, too, <laughs> back in the day. Um, I think it's great um, because it tells me that I don't have to worry about a new edition of the game, meaning, oh, the realms is over, you know, because it isn't anyway, and people would go on playing it. But it, it, it means, oh, good, there's going to be a lot more attention again, so I can, maybe we can do this, maybe we can do that, all the things that we, we didn't have time to do again. Now, we can't do them right away because we have, the company has to launch fourth edition, so they've got to give the player's handbook, the monster manual, the dungeon master's guide out. So there may not be enough room right away at the beginning, but I know that there's going to be all these cool ideas coming down the pipe. And we saw the, the presentation. Now you know some of the cool things that are being worked on. Right. What are, what are what can I do? You know, what what is next? What what do I have to be there for? Now the main thing about the Forgotten Realms, any world, we may think of it as a place in, in our mind. It may paint these mental pictures. But what a world really is, any world really is, is people, the characters. And that means in this case, with the realms, we have to do a whole bunch of new characters. 
Um, I have to be coming in with new, exciting people, regardless of what race they are, um, that the people are going to care about and want to know the stories of. Because for me, it's it's the stories. It, no, we all tell the stories when we're role playing, but I have to bring you how they got there. If you're staring at this. Um, huge dwarf, and he's different from the other dwarves. How is he different from the other dwarves? Um, there's the stereotypical fantasy babe, you know, the, the fantasy babe character. Okay, yeah, but she's a person. She's not a body. She's a person. What is that person? How did she get here? What are her aims? What's she trying to do in life? That's my job, to fill that in, and I've got to do a whole new cast of characters, and I want to get at it. That's fantastic. And in, in addition to these new characters that we're going to be seeing, we've also seen a major event in the timeline of the Forgotten Realms that's going to play a major role in the fourth edition and sort of bring some of the forgotten nature back to the Forgotten Realms, and that's the Spell Plague. And from what we've learned about it so far, it's, it's an event where the goddess of magic is killed, and it has a, a ripple effect throughout not only magic, but throughout the actual physical layout of the realms. What do you think about that as sort of a device to make the setting accessible for people who maybe had lost track of all the details and it sort of provides a starting point. What do you think of that event and how do you think it might affect some of the major characters like an Elminster who obviously is very involved with magic? Oh boy. it's it, The spell pl- plague to some people, well, you know in, in any sports game where you, you whack something with something else? The realms is the thing that gets whacked, and the spell plague is the thing that does the whacking. So if it's, say, a a hockey game and somebody hits that puck as hard as they can, that was the spell plague. And what that means is you thought you knew the realms, but at any given place and time, things might be subtly different. And, And one way to think of it is if you knew that you were being transported ahead 50 years in real time, let's just, you know, and you knew you were being set down right in front of your own house or your own apartment, but it's 50 years in the future. You go, okay, I know where I am. Yeah, but do things work the same way? What's changed? And so the whole realms is like that. So we're back to, I don't have to know this stuff. I don't have to look it up in a rule book, and therefore I don't have to look at the old rule books necessarily. It's all new to me. I have to role play. I have to be intensely aware of what's going on around me. Now, in the case of Elminster, okay, you have a chosen of Mistra, and you have something bad happened to Mistra. Well, we already know from the past, from the Shadows of the Avatar, what happened the last time Mister got KO'd, um, and not as badly. Um, all these memories came crashing into his brain, and if you can imagine, in the spell plague. It's not just going to be Mister that goes down. We don't know what happens to Zeus, the other god of magic, or Savras. We don't know what happens to the other chosen. But we can guess that unless they had some other means of staying alive, some of them probably died too. What that means is anybody still standing, and we already know what happened to Kelvin before the spell plague, um, some of their memories go, because some of Mister's essence was in the other chosen, go flaming into the brains of the the surviving chosen. Now, that doesn't mean that he suddenly becomes three times as smart, three times as fast, three times as beautiful. It means somebody's throwing three times as many memories into his brain, and he can't, they're not his memories, so they're not organized, and they keep intruding at odd moments, but he can't sort of wander through them like an organized library and say, ah, let me revisit that time where you you made that agreement. I'll just look over your shoulder. No, it's just, he can't retrieve them when he wants, so he's even more crazy than he was before. He's also very sad. He's also had magic go terribly wrong, so he doesn't trust the magic he has left. And I'm not going to say anything more specific about his physical state, other than to say the spell plague probably affected him, too. So he's still alive. He's still in the realms. But it's a different element. Than, than we're seeing everybody through new eyes. Everybody's around... The, the people you thought you knew, Driss and so on, Elminster, the people who are still around, but they're not the same people that you left the, that, those years ago. The spell plague and the past few years have both changed them. You have to get to know them all over again. They can be different. How? Read on, as they say. <laughs> so that's great. I mean, you have the, the new characters that we'll be seeing pop up in the setting. You have the old characters who have been immeasurably changed through uh, recent events. And now you have something like 
the living forgotten realms come along, which takes this new face of this world that we've known for so long and brings it to brings it to a place where it's going to become a giant sandbox for all of the RPGA players to, to adventure in. And that must be truly amazing. I mean, just the possibilities of all the different places and all the different people and everything, and all the different stories that you'll be able to tell through the Living Campaign, that must be really exciting for everybody as well. Certainly. Uh, to me, I, I, I look upon the, the RPGAs using the Living Forgotten Realms as their setting as somewhat akin to be being in the center of a newscast where they've split the screen into 42 little talking heads. There's somebody in Shanghai. There's somebody in uh, in Iraq. There's somebody in uh, Australia. There's somebody in Canada. There's somebody in South America. And they're all talking, telling you what just happened in their corner of the world that day. And, and what's happening is all of these unfolding plots because all of the people who work regionally in the RPG are working on plots to underpin their adventures. How each individual adventure turns out depends on who's sitting at the table playing that adventure. But the ongoing plots, in the same way that the ongoing plot of the realms assumed that, that, that something happened, you know, regardless of what happened to your player characters, there was an overall sort of history that we built up. This is going to be happening in every corner of the realms now with all sorts of people um, contributing their stuff. And inherently, all sorts of people contributing their stuff is stronger than any one voice. So it isn't like, oh, Ed's going to tell us what happened in his world this month. You've got 14, 20, 28, 30. Now, they may not all be Ed, but that's fine, because that's the diversity, that's the variety. That's what gives you the full richness. It, to me, I have one set of values of what makes me happy, what, what I think is comfort food where I want to relax. It might be different for someone else. So if only I am writing it, then you're only seeing my little worldview. Then when you have like 28 or 40 people writing it, you get the full variety. You might not like everything, but it's like the real world. It's a huge grab bag. So there's something for you anywhere. And to me, that's great because it's that many more people um, stirring the soup and throwing in stuff. And, and it's okay to have too many cooks for this because it isn't like a perfect recipe. It's a stew that we all put stuff in. And just like when you you have a stew at home, rather than, say, at a cafeteria line, you dip the ladle in and you lift the ladle up and say, oh, broccoli. I don't think I like broccoli today. And you let the ladle go down and you dip it again and say, oh, look, you know, and you get something you want. And then you lift the ladle out. So that, that's the way the realms will be enriched by everybody working on it. Um, I'm not saying this because I'm a company minion, because I'm not a company minion. Um, I'm saying this because I'm genuinely excited by the possibilities, and it is so, I, as an RPG Chartered Life member, um, it's been around from the beginning, I know how much more it matters when you think, oh, I didn't just play that game and got some points. I played that game and we changed the world. You know, it's like, wow, we did something and it mattered. It doesn't necessarily have to be big world-shaking stuff, it's just... Oh yeah, I was there when we killed that king. I was there when so and so took over. I was there when they made this agreement, the elves and the dwarves in this place. I, you were there at all the important moments of history. You were there on the grassy knoll, as they say. You know, it, it, you you matter. What you do as a, as your characters do in gaming matters more than, than than a world that is just presented to you when you buy each new product. So in addition to all of those things that we just talked about, we obviously have the campaign setting that's coming out this summer. And then moving forward, what can we expect from you in terms of your role? You had mentioned, obviously, you're not an internal employee. You're an external employee. What is your current involvement as far as what you're working on? In if you can, I know you can't be too specific, yes. but and then moving forward, can we expect to see more novels in the in the future? Like, what have you have you thought about where you're going with Forgotten Realms in the near future? I have. Um, I'm not allowed to tell you what novels I'm working on um, or what we have the plans for the future. I I will certainly tell you that if they don't manage to run me over. There will be future novels from me. Okay. Um, and we are talking about cool stuff to do. Um, I'm also involved in another project that um, I don't really think I'm allowed to tell you anything about at all, so I'll just tell you to go to Amazon.com and type in Blackstaff Tower, and there's already, you'll see an entry there for the first thing in this series. Now, again, I can say nothing about it, but I figure if you read the text and read between the lines, you can see, oh... This is cool, and think of a line beginning with that book, and then you'll know one of the other irons that's in the fire. And 
at the moment, um, I am working on unofficially. I'm working on six things. Officially, I'm working on one thing、um, to do with the realms. And I also promised everybody. I started doing the Border Kingdoms on the on the website, and we got so busy with other things. I will finish them. And I do intend that they be part of the free content rather than the D&D Insider because they're they're going to be the old realms. Now, and there's nothing wrong with the old realms because the the thing about the border kingdoms is it's like these two fields over to that barn. This is my kingdom. These two fields, just these two fields, but hey, they're the best two fields. See my magnificent armor. See my crown. Made it myself this Thursday, but see my crown. So we're talking small realms, so they can maybe. None of them will be there by the time you get to the. But you can pick them up and use them. And if it's an ever-changing stew of tiny little realms put together by adventurers, then that will still presumably hold true. At the after the spell plague's effects have largely worked out, and we're in the quote new realms, so you could pick up these things and use them. Because we intend to avoid being specific about that area, so that you can use it that way. That's where if your adventurer wants to go and retire, but he wants to be king. And you know the dungeon master doesn't theoretically doesn't want to give him a throne. And guess what? You don't want a throne. If you want a retirement, you don't want a throne. You can have one or the other. If you're getting on the throne, you're not really retiring. You're trading all your fun stuff of going out and sleeping on the hard ground and killing dragons every morning for the really bad stuff of getting knifed in the back by courtiers every afternoon and then looking in your goblet to see if there's poison in it along with the wine all the time. So it's not a retirement. But if If the dungeon master doesn't want to take one of the heads of a kingdom that it's in print is one of the major places. Hey, the border kingdoms is where you go to carve out your own little thing. And I, you know, I want to wrap that up, but I can't really talk in specifics.、Uh, you saw some of the directions in that、uh, that, are, that the company is putting out products for the near future in that presentation earlier today. I would love to tell you all the cool things I want to work on, but first of all.、Um, That would get me in trouble, and secondly, that would be a good way for them to say, "Oh, well, now he's told them we've got to change it." Right. So it, it wouldn't happen anyway. And I, and I, I'm I'm too excited. I got too many ideas that I want to, you know. I, as Stephen Leacock said, he he jumped on the horse and galloped madly off in all directions at once. Well, I want to have 42 horses and be on all of them galloping madly in all directions at once because I've got to cover this whole world. It's like the Pony Express. I've got to get there first and say, okay, this is what's here. Okay, now I'm over here, and I've got to keep running and covering all this stuff. And I'm now at the stage where I'm straining in the starting blocks, and I can't wait to get home and get right back into it because I've got a novel to finish <laughs> and then get on to the next thing. I I wish I could be more specific. I really want to be, but. Right now, I do not want to screw up in any way. The fourth edition launch and it coming out, and, and you know, I, I don't want to do anything to to darken that or、um, hobble it or, or take away from it in any way because I want this so badly. To succeed and be a smash hit, because I want to grow our gaming audience again. I want to see more young gamers coming into it. Now, I'm not saying that the gamers we don't have in it aren't producing young gamers as fast as they can to swell our ranks. But I need, I need to see new people coming in and saying, "Oh, D and D, yeah, I remember D and D." Or, "Oh yeah, that was that weird game, wasn't it?" I want to see people say, "You played D and D? Tell me all about it." I need that excitement back again. Well, I think even without the specifics, and we don't want to force you to talk about anything you can't. I think for your fans to hear you so excited about what's ahead for the realms and the projects that you're working on, I think that's enough for us right now because at least we know you're stoked and you're working on this stuff, and it's going to be great. And and I agree with you. I think that for me, as a, a gamer who has been a lifelong gamer, I'm always worried about the state of our hobby. And I'm always worried about whether or not we're attracting younger people to come in and play, and and making more lifelong gamers as they come in. I'm very optimistic that with some of the tools、mm-hmm. that Fourth Edition is going to bring with it, there's a new opportunity to really involve a lot more gamers and a lot more non-gamers in Fourth Edition, and that will obviously by proxy. Expose them to the realms, and then maybe they pick up the books, and then maybe they look farther back and see the history of this great setting. So, it's a very exciting time for that, and I'm very hopeful. It is indeed. Thank you very much. To me, the, for me, the key way to approach the realms is you treat it as a real place that you just get to look at. And, and maybe step into. I don't mean you're crazy and you think it's really real, but I mean you treat, you try and. Give it the respect that you would a real place. So to me, it's just like somebody told you, okay, we have to jump ahead and tell this story here now. 
you know, that's fine, that's cool. It's still the realms. Um, it's it's not they're taking away my realms. No, they're ripping me away from the candy store before I was finished gobbling up everything I could see. And they're saying, no, you can come back tomorrow, kid. We have to close now. Yeah, and I'm going, no, 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 but I haven't stuffed my face with that and that and that. You can see them tomorrow, kid. You know, and, and I'm, I, I have that little feeling in the back of my mind, but that's not a bad feeling. That's just a, aw, okay, I'll be back tomorrow. You know, <laughs> so I'll be back. Well, that's great. I think that's a great place for us to wrap up, too. I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us. We cannot wait to see what's in store for the realms, and hopefully we'll be able to check in sometime in the future. So thanks again, Ed Greenwood, and uh, have a great rest of the show. Thank you very much, and I wish everybody could be here and see all these guys. And I mean guys in a non-gender specific way, of course. I'm sitting down at the tables just going, ooh, the new stuff. It, fourth edition is worth a look. And from what I've seen of the fourth edition rulebook, this is the first set of rules that you can sit down as a non-gamer rather than sitting down at a table of people who already play the game and being taught by them. This is the first one I think you can sit down and easily go through by yourself and at the end of it say, boy, that was fun. Let's do it again. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to you know, reach out and talk to gamers. This is great. All right, thanks again and have a great show. A pleasure. You too.